Hey everybody, and welcome to Quarantine Stuff You Should Know. I am your host, AJ Hannenberg, and I am usually joined by two other fellas to do our podcast Classical Stuff You Should Know, but they're in quarantine, and I'm in quarantine, and you're in quarantine, so I'm putting out a bunch of episodes centered around the book The Decameron for the next hundred or so days, totaling up to 101 episodes or as long as quarantine lasts. And I'm doing that mostly just because it's fun, and also because the Decameron is about a bunch of people who are also in quarantine, telling stories to keep themselves occupied, and it seemed specially apt for the occasion. So I'll be telling you stories. Uh, I told a story last time from a guy named Panfilo, and this next one is coming from a girl named Neophile. And as I tell the story, you should note that most of the opinions expressed are opinions of the characters from around 13... 48 or so. So these are not my opinions. I'll try to keep it as close to what it says in the Decameron as possible, and the, while maybe censoring a few things for sensitive listeners. And then near the end, I'll give my own little commentary about what I think about that particular story, if you're at all, at all interested. If you're not, feel free to just turn the, the thing off. I'm okay with that, because I will never I will never know, and we'll still get the download. So either way, uh, I win. Um, okay, so here we go with day one, story number two. The stories are split up over 10 days. So the ladies had laughed at parts of Panfilo's story and praised it in its entirety. And when it was done, Pampanea, the queen for the day, commanded Neophile, who is sitting next to Panfilo, to continue the stories. And she had courtly manners and beauty, so she said, I will absolutely do that for you. And then she says this, and I quote, In his storytelling, Panfilo has shown us how the benevolence of God disregards our errors when they result from something we cannot understand. And in mine, I intend to show you how this same benevolence gives proof of its infallible truth by patiently enduring the faults of those who, although they ought to serve as true witnesses to it in both word and deed, do just the opposite. And I tell it in the hope that we will all put what we believe into practice with greater conviction. So if you didn't get that, she's essentially saying he showed how God's grace comes to those people who, who accidentally cross it without knowing it. And I will show how that same benevolent give the the that same benevolence gives proof to truth by enduring the faults of those who should be very holy but aren't very holy. Okay, so her story goes as follows: Once in Paris. There was a great merchant who run, ran a flourishing cloth business, and his name was Giannotto di Sivigni, and he was honest and upright, and he had a great friendship with a local Jewish merchant named Abraham. And they, Abraham was an upright and wonderful guy, and honest, and there was nothing to reproach him with, and so Giannotto, recognizing that this man was his friend and that he was upright and honest, would often be bummed that he was destined for perdition, even though he was such an upright and honest man, simply because he lacked the true Christian faith. And so he came to him, and as bluntly and gently as he could, as merchants are known for talking, he said, hey man, you gotta get off that Jewish religion train and come try this Christian business out, because it's pretty great over here. And continuously tried to get him to become Christianized. And Abraham responded, yes, I, I hear you, but... I don't think any faith is good or holy except the Jewish one. And I was born in it, and I intend to die in it. But, as any good merchant should be, Giannotto was not dissuaded, and Giannotto kept at him, kept arguing and speaking bluntly. And even though the Jew was a grand master of Jewish law, he found the arguments kind of moving and compelling. And, you know, whether, whether that was the Holy Spirit working or just his great friendship with Giannotto, still he clung. And so Giannotto worked even harder. The more, Gian, the more that Abraham clung, the more, in, he, the more he entreated until finally Abraham, exasperated and overcome, said, okay, I, I see what you're saying and I'm willing. I'm willing to make the switch if my one condition is met. And my one condition is that I go to Rome and observe the vicar of God, and likewise his cardinals and priests, and their manner of living. And if I find there that your faith is better than mine, I'll do what I promised and become a Christian. Now, 
poor Giannotto thought, oh, well, I've, lo- I've lost everything. That's, that's a horrible thing because if he goes, I'm sunk. He'll see the filthy lives of all the clergy and how terrible they are at, at being just generally good people. And not only will he not convert, but if he had converted, he would have gone back to the Jewish, Jewish faith. And so he tries to get Abraham not to go. He says, hey, man, wouldn't you rather stay here? Uh, there are guys that can baptize you and teach you anything you want to know and answer all your questions. And there's plenty of learned men here. And plus, you are a wealthy man. If you travel on those roads, you know that traveling is dangerous for wealthy men. You get jumped and lose everything. And Abraham was insistent. He said, if you want me to be a Christian, I must go. Well, Giannotto was like, well, there's, there's nothing nothing I can lose from this, right? He's, he's a Jewish man now, and if he goes and he doesn't like the Cardinals, well, he'll be a Jewish man anyway, so go then, and good luck, right? There's nothing to be lost in letting him go. So Abraham goes, he travels to Rome, and he finds some Jewish friends there with whom he can stay, and he starts to observe, and he observes the Pope, and he observes the Cardinals, and he observes the priests, and what he finds is that the clergymen are completely unrestrained by any sense of shame or remorse. They commit lust in both the normal and sodomitical kind, and so prostitutes and boys have acquired acquired great favors from them and have great influence over the priests. They are all unilaterally drunks, gluttons, and sots, which, stepping out here, that's a word I had to look up, a sot, which means kind of a habitual drunkard. So I don't know why, why we say drunk and sot, maybe just to reiterate, but I digress. Okay, who served, they were drunks and sots who served their bellies more than anything, well, except for their lust. They were terribly money-grubbing and were after cash all the time, and they would just as readily sell the blood of a Christian as they would sold sacred objects, sacraments, church offices, basically anything they could do to make money, and they did more business and employed more middlemen than anybody he had known in the cloth trade in Paris. He's like, these guys are doing way more cash than I do daily, and isn't that terrible? They, oh, sorry, this is Abraham, so not the cloth business, in Abraham's business. Um, And these priests gave the name to what they were doing as far as buying and selling. They called it procurement. And to their gluttony, they called it daily rations. And by renaming it, it seemed as as if they wanted to fool God into thinking they were doing something other than being terribly sinful just by renaming it as they would, you know, do to fool a normal person. And so Abraham, seeing all this terrible behavior is disgusted because he is an upright, honest, and chaste man. And so he leaves and returns to Paris. Well, Giannotto saw him and he gave him a couple days to rest from his journey because that's a pretty big journey. And then he asked, he said, hey man, how, how was it up there in Rome? What'd you think? And Abraham replies, I think they are a curse. Not only that, they deserve to be cursed from heaven. What I saw was no holiness, no devotion, no good works, and instead those were replaced with lust, avarice, gluttony, fraud, envy, pride, and all of those things. And even worse, it seems that those things have so much influence there that instead of being a forge for good works, it appears to be a forge for diabolical ones. It seems like all these guys, instead of promoting Christianity, are attempting to do their best to reduce Christianity to ashes and let it come to nothing. It seems they want to totally break the support of the church. And, you know, Giannotto is kind of dismayed, but he says, however, since it hasn't happened that Christianity has been reduced to nothing, since they are unsuccessful and they really seem to be trying their best, I am right to conclude that the Holy Spirit must indeed be its foundation and support, for it is truer and holier than any other. And therefore, not only am I convinced that I need to become a Christian, I will now let nothing stand in my way. So, you and I must go to church. And Giannotto is overjoyed that his friend has made this decision and, understandably, surprised. So he takes the he takes Abraham, takes him to Notre Dame, where he says, Hello, priests, please baptize this Jewish man, and the priests are a little bit reluctant, but then hearing that Abraham himself wants to be baptized, they go ahead. And as he rises from the font, Giannotto renames him Giovanni, which in this tradition would mean that he's acting as his godfather, which I also looked up and means that he is taking responsibility for his ethical and religious education. So, 
Giovanni, the newly christened Giovanni, lives not only an upright life, but a holy one. And that's the end of the story. Today's was really quick. Uh, so a couple of my thoughts coming out of this story, the thoughts of A.J. Hannenberg. Now we are out of, out of the, the tellings of Neophile. There's one spot that I, I sort of skipped over in the story where uh, Giannotto argues with Abraham and he says, look, man, you, you have to realize that Christianity is always getting better and it, it's on its way up. And you got to see that, that Judaism is on its way. It's on its way out, right? It's, it's eventually going to amount to nothing. And I thought that was interesting because apparently current believers of the Jewish faith didn't really get the message in 1340 because it's, it's still flourishing in a lot of areas. So in that way, Giannotto was wrong. Um, he made a guess and he missed. The other thing I, I find is interesting is that while they viewed the Catholic Church as, as fully corrupt then, or at least much of the clergy, some of that hasn't changed. A lot of people still hold that notion about the Catholic clergy, especially when the, all of the, the scandal about, um, about pedophilia was, was uncovered and sort of released to the public. And the reaction that most people have to that is the reaction that Giannotto expected from, uh, from Abraham was to abandon the church and say that these men are terrible. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, that that's, that's totally an, uh, a wrong reaction. I mean, to see that a religion has not brought any sort of actual good living to the, the followers of that religion is def is certainly a mark against it. Right. And as, as a Christian and having, ha like having spoken to many Christians about this, the, the common retort is that, you know, you have to, you have to look at, at Christ himself and not necessarily Christ's followers. But I do see the logic. I see the logic of saying these people aren't good people at all. Why should I follow a religion that seems to make villains? Right. And I understand that. But I can also, I, I, I also understand the reaction of Abraham saying that Christianity has been growing and flourishing for thousands of years, despite the best efforts of some of those at the top to make it come to nothing, which means that there must be something else going on than just really solid leadership. So I can kind of see both things coming. And I think that's sort of interesting. Um, obviously, I, I sort of choose the latter because I am yet a Christian, even though some things kind of pop up that I disagree with, right? Our leaders aren't always correct. They aren't always making great decisions. But nonetheless, I, I think the teachings are right. So I'm, I'm still on the team, folks. Okay, that's, that's it for today's story. This is going out probably around 5.45. I'm recording this at about 5.30 Texas time. Uh, so hopefully I'll get this out soon. I'm going to try to get tomorrow's episode out a little bit earlier, but no promises because... I'm in charge of this, and you can't stop me. Okay, all right. See you later, folks. Bye.